Hi, I'm Laura Fulford, welcoming you to this Epigenie webinar today. Today's webinar is titled Advances in Chip-Based Technologies for Profiling Epigenomic Landscapes and Gene Regulatory Networks, and is being presented by Adam Blattler from Active Motif. Adam began his studies in epigenetics after joining the lab of Dr. Be Peggy Farnham as a graduate student at the University of California, Davis, where he studied the function and genome-wide DNA binding properties of evolutionary divergent zinc finger proteins between human and mouse. His thesis project later evolved to investigate the functions of ZBTB transcription factors, specifically Kaizo, and their relation to global distribution of methylated DNA and various histone modifications. He received his PhD from UC Davis in 2014. After completing his doctorate work, he began working as a research scientist for Active Motif, where he currently is responsible for developing new assays and services to complement the company's strong portfolio of epigenetic research tools. As always, we will have a brief question and answer session after the webinar, so please type in any questions you have into the questions box, which appears on the right hand side of your screen, and put them to Adam at the end. Okay, so now over to you Adam for the presentation. Great, wonderful, thank you for that introduction, and thank you everyone here for tuning in today. Uh, today, as Laura mentioned, I'll be talking about advancements we've made, or advances we've made at Active Motif to study chip-based technologies, specifically for looking at epigenetic landscapes and gene regulatory networks. Now, this background slide uh, basically schemed, it sums up everything that I'll be talking about today and how we study the epigenetic modifications that happen on our genome. And I'll be talking about everything from DNA methylation of CPG dinucleotides all the way up to histone modifications and transcription factor binding. And uh, just to give you a little bit of background on some of those marks, DNA methylation happens at cytosines, specifically in the context of a CPG dinucleotide. And this modification happens by way of DNA methyltransferases. Now, CPG dinucleotides are enriched at what are called CPG islands, and these are often found at promoter regions. When these are unmethylated, the gene is typically expressed and when they become methylated, the gene uh, is then repressed. The next level of epigenetic modification happens at the histone level, and these are modifications of specific histone, kale, histone tails. A typical histone octomer contains uh, two molecules of H2A, H2B, H3, and H4, and their N-terminal and C-terminal, in some cases, tails are modified. Uh, by several molecules, or by several proteins shown in green and red. The modifications on these histone tails are shown in dark circles. You have methylation, acetylation, and so forth. And these different arrangements of uh, different modifications actually dictate the epigenetic state of the genomic regions they're identified in. Now, I mentioned there are several different uh, modifications, but most of the modifications we study in uh, the field of epigenetics occur on the histone H3 N-terminal tail. And there are actually just a small condensed list of marks that tell us most of what we need to know about gene regulation. There are uh, several active marks here that I've shown, K4ME3 and K20, or K9 acetyl that are found at promoter regions. K4 monomethylation and H3K27 acetylation indicate enhancer regions. And regions with H3K36 trimethylation and K79 dimethylation signify regions of active gene elongation. On the repressed side, you have two marks, H3K27 trimethylation and H3K9 trimethylation, which are just general broad regions of repressed chromatin. Next, for transcription factors, basically a transcription factor is a protein that binds the DNA or can be recruited to the DNA by other factors and they can bind anywhere from several hundred to several thousand sites in the genome. They can be classified as being promoter proximal or far away, or di uh, promoter proximal or distal or far away uh, from transcription start sites. And they've been shown to function in several different ways. You can have um, factors that are responsible for looping, for recruitment of other factors to either activate or repress gene expression and for the assisted binding of other uh, transcription factors and uh, co-activators, co-repressors. Now, all three of these events, DNA methylation, histone modifications, and transcri transcription factor binding, all work together to either um, repress or activate gene expression. Uh, 
And this is actually a quite complex uh, mechanism by which these three act together. And today I'll be talking about ways that we at Active Motif have developed um, improvements on uh, assays that aim to study these modifications. Now, as I mentioned, um, these, the way that these factors and marks interact is very complex. And the Roadmap Epigenomics, Epigenomics Consortium just completed, and they uh, published several papers in uh, Nature this, uh, just this year. And you can see here just the complexity of the situation. You have several different histone modifications, uh, DNA hypersensitivity, which indicates active regions, RNA-seq, which indicates the expression of genes throughout the genome, and whole genome by sulfite sequencing, which looks at the genome-wide methylation state of every CPG dinucleotide. And altogether, these marks uh, work together to either activate or repress gene expression. Now, the way we study this, uh, and the main method we study, transcription factor binding and histone modification distribution, is by a, uh, a technique called chromatin immunoprecipitation, or CHIP. And CHIP uh, works a little bit like this, just uh, to sum it up. You start by fixing cells, you then sonicate and isolate your chromatin, and you perform an immunoprecipitation for a factor or a histone modification of interest, resulting in the purification of DNA protein complexes associated with that factor. You then reverse cross-link and purify the DNA, and the downstream uh, analysis of this DNA can either happen by sequencing or PCR. If you're sequencing, you generate a library, and you can sequence it on multiple platforms, and there are several different tools. Uh, there are multiple, multiple tools uh, that can be used to study the, uh, the bioinformatic output, um, depending on the application that you're looking at. So CHIP has been around for quite a while, but there are several problems that, uh, or just several limitations that arise with a standard CHIP assay, and I've listed those here. Uh, one is the, the reliability of actually being able to quantitate differences between uh, CHIP-seq experiments between multiple samples for the same factor. Uh, it can be difficult sometimes to identify a proper antibody for your factor of interest. Uh, identifying uh, the precise region of DNA that's actually interacting with your protein of interest. Also, CHIP usually uses uh, large numbers of cells. And uh, finally, it can sometimes be a very lengthy immunoprecipitation and library protocol. And we at Active Motif have worked on improving several of these, uh, these limitations. And I've listed the assays that we've developed to attack these to the right. First, today I'll talk about CHIP spike-in, which is a method that we've developed here in-house to control for the differences in experimental variation between your samples. Now, these differences are often undetectable by CHIP-seq, and the reason for this is because you are actually amplifying the DNA and loading the same amount of DNA uh, for each of your samples onto the sequencing machine. So this actually eliminates many of the variations you expect to see, either before and after a drug treatment in cancer versus normal cells, before and after, after siRNA knockdown, or in, in different stages of development. Now, we've taken advantage of a very specific uh, Drosophila histone variant that uh, we can spike into a chip reaction and use to control for these variations. Here I show just an example of how chip-seq spike-in works for the, uh, the process of normalization. You start with a standard uh, chip experiment where you have your chromatin in your, let's say in this case, uh, controlled DMSO carrier treated samples, and your, in this case, EZH2 inhibitor. So EZH2 inhibitors would prevent the, the deposition of K27 trimethylation, uh, a repressive mark. And what you can do then is you spike in a very small amount of Drosophila chromatin into the same tube that you have your input chromatin, and you perform your chip assay. Now, the chip DNA that comes out as a result, as you'd expect, you have lots of K27 trimethylation uh, associated DNA in the untreated sample, whereas in this EZH2 inhibitor sample, you have much less DNA. However, through library amplification, you, uh, you end up amplifying these, these fragments to a level of uh, similar amounts before it's loaded onto the machine. But taking into account the differences in the Drosophila chromatin or Drosophila DNA present in the two samples, you can then normalize your chip seq data appropriately. 
And here's an example of what that looks like pre and post normalization. So here I show K27 trimethylation data. As I was mentioning, your DMSO treated sample here in control looks very similar to the inhibitor treated sample. You can actually, it's very difficult to tell any differences in enrichment across this region of this chromosome. And as a result, or as a uh, comparison, here's K4ME3, uh, which is not expected to change after treatment. Now, after spike in normalization, you can actually see a drastic reduction in K27 trimethylation signal, and uh, K20, or K4ME3 remains the same. And these are actually what you would expect for biological differences due to the treated uh, samples. The next, uh, the next hurdle I'll talk about is the identification of proper antibodies for your factor. Now, we at Active Motif do offer several uh, ChIP-seq validated um, antibodies. However, it's not always going to be possible to come up with a ChIP-seq validated antibody uh, for your factor of interest. And so how do you go about studying a factor for which you don't have an antibody? Um, there are many proteins where this may be the case. Maybe you're studying a protein with a known mutation and you want to overexpress it. Um, or maybe you want to study a specific isoform of a protein. And in these cases, the best, um, the best approach is to actually epitope tag your protein and study it after, after expressing it transiently in the cell. And the way you do that is you clone your, your gene into a plasmid vector, and in frame with, that pla with your gene, you uh, attach this epitope tag, it then gets expressed, and the protein resulting has this epitope tag that can be, uh, an antibody can de be designed against it for your ChIP-seq experiments. At Active Motif, we have recently developed a new tag uh, with the idea of ChIP-seq in mind. This is designed for a highly specific pull-down of your recombinant protein uh, for ChIP-seq. And the way that this differs from your typical tag, say a flag or an HA tag, is that we actually designed the tag itself to be very low background uh, in the human genome. And then we, end, we designed a very high specificity antibody to this tag. Uh, now this tag is a very low molecular weight and it actually has no folding. So the idea here is that it actually prevents the, um, any impediment of the DNA binding uh, that you would see from larger tags like a GFP or a flag tag. Here I'm showing some of the data that we've generated. We actually attach, we attach this AM tag to a June D protein and compared that to endogenous June D using an antibody against the endogenous June D. And then here at the bottom we have ENCODE June D chip seq data. This is all in HCT116 colorectal cancer cells. And as you can see, as you look down this profile, it's very similar, it's, it's, very, uh, it's the same across all of these cells. And we've shown that it's a very high degree of reproducibility, uh, depending on it, across all of your experiments, whether you're using the endogenous antibody or this AM tag, and it lines up quite nicely with the ENCODE GUND data. The next aspect I'll talk about is identifying the precise region of DNA bound by your factor. And for this, we've worked with Frank Pugh uh, to develop chip exo as a kit here at Active Motif. Many of you have probably heard of ChIP-XO, but I'll give you a basic schematic of how it works. You basically perform your chromatin immunoprecipitation for your transcription factor of interest. And after pulling down the, the uh, after performing the IP, you treat with an exonuclease, which digests the DNA all the way down to the site where the transcription factor binds. You then reverse crosslink, elute, and uh, with this P7 primer, you can extend and finish your library, and when you sequence, you get two peaks that overlap only at the region where the transcription factor was bound. And when you do this, you actually eliminate any DNA that was, uh, that was not uh, particularly, uh, that was not bound by your factor of interest. Now, here, just a schematic showing the advancement of chip technology and getting higher and higher resolution data. Uh, some of you may remember the days of chip chip. You can see it's a very broad mark here for this transcription factor. Chip seek improved on that, and chip exo digests away even uh, more DNA to where you're only ending up with the, uh, the region that's bound by your factor of interest. So here's some data that we've generated for CTCF. You can see here that the binding site that we've identified for CTCF in this case is 45 base pairs long. CTCF has a 20 base pair uh, DNA footprint, um, 
but there are there's fair hindrance that limits it only to 45 base pairs. And if you compare this to standard chip seek data, you have anywhere from 90 to 120 base pairs uh, for your triple typical footprint. And within this CTCF chip exo data, we were able to identify the strong CTCF consensus DNA binding motif. Now, uh, knowing the precise binding site of your DNA is important, but you can go actually even one step further to find out a little bit more about the epigenetic characteristics of the DNA that you're binding. And historically, the way that you do this is very expensive. After finding the uh, DNA binding sites by performing ChIP-seq, you can then compare this ChIP-seq data to something like whole genome by sulfide sequencing data or reduced representation by sulfide sequencing data to find the methylation state of your factor of interest. Now, this is important for identifying, uh, for further characterizing your factor in terms of its um, role in the regulation of gene expression. And it's recently been shown that uh, DNA methylation can have a positive or negative effect on transcription factor binding, depending on the factor you're studying. So for this, uh, we've actually simplified the, um, the sequencing that's necessary by by performing chip by sulfide seq. So in this case, you're performing a chip, but you're only sequencing the DNA that's bound by your factor, rather than comparing your chip DNA to uh, whole genome by sulfide sequencing data. And the way this works is you perform your standard, standard chromatin immunoprecipitation, you uh, purify the DNA, and then you perform library prep uh, prior to amplification. But this library prep is special in that you ligate methylated adapters. You then uh, perform by sulfide conversion, to convert any non-methylated Cs to Ts, and then uh, PCR amplify and sequence. And what you end up with, in this case, we have K27 trimethylation, chip-seq data, and each of these lines represents a read across this region, and the blue horizontal uh, lines, or vertical lines, represent the methylation state of CPG dinucleotides that are found within these peaks. So red being the methylated CPGs, and blue being unmethylated CPGs. The next, the next aspect of CHIP that we've tackled here at Active Motif is reducing the amount of cells that are actually required for a CHIP experiment. And this has specifically been done uh, to complement our epigenetic services here at Active Motif. And we've been able to reduce the amount of cells required for a CHIP-seq experiment down to 10,000 cells for histone modification and 50,000 cells, uh, 50,000 to 500,000 cells, depending on the transcription factor and the abundance of that factor that you're trying to study. And here I show some of the data that we've generated here in, uh, for the sake of for H3K27 acetylation. We actually went down to 6,000 cells, K27 trimethylation at 10,000, and CTCF at 50,000 cells. Finally, I'd like to introduce a technology that we've been working on that we're really excited about here at Active Motif called TAMCHIP. And it, it does uh, limit the, it reduces the lengthy amino precipitation assay, but it also, as I'll show you, um, has several other advantages over a standard chip, chip seek experiment. Now, TAM chip, or transposase assisti assisted chip, uh, takes advantage of a specific uh, TN5 transposase that's been uh, attached to these sequencing adapters and your antibody of choice, whether that be a secondary antibody or a primary antibody. And what happens is the transposase is directed to your transcription factor binding site of, of target uh, by the antibody, and the transposase then integrates these sequencing adapters straight into the DNA. And so what you're doing is essentially performing the IP, or the, your chromatin IP, and your library generation all in one step. Now, TAMCHIP uh, actually simplifies this protocol uh, in several ways. Um, first, it reduces the amount of starting material needed for the experiment. It actually minimizes the amount of shearing required for a standard chip. It has the potential to eliminate the actual IP step, whether you use magnetic beads or agarose beads to pull down your complexes, because you're actually generating the library at the binding site of the antibody. And it has the potential, uh, and this is the really exciting part, it has the potential for multiple targets in the same sample. And I'll talk about that in a second. But the way that this standard TAMCHIP workflow uh, performs is you perform your antibody binding. This recruits your, this brings your TN5 transposase complex with the adapter sequences, 
to your binding site. You then get integration of these adapters and then downstream sequencing. Now, I mentioned that we could potentially multiplex using this, uh, this setup, and the way you would do that is if you have different adapter sequences with different indexes attached to different antibodies, you would imagine you can actually perform a chip, say, for K4 trimethylation and K9 trimethylation, uh, two very different marks in the same tube using two different antibodies and two different uh, TN5 adapter uh, indexes. Now, TAM chip data here that we've generated, it's been shown to be highly reproducible and uh, has very low background. And it actually, if you compare it to a K4 ME3 data set that's done using our chip, chip it high sensitivity kit, the overlap is identical. And you can see here the replicate to replicate reproducibility is very high. Uh, and you get what you would expect for a K4 ME3 chip seek experiment. Now, so far in this talk, I have addressed several different chip technologies. Um, and this, it tells you a lot about where your transcription factor or histone modifications of interest are distributed across the genome. But this doesn't really tell you everything about the way that our genome acts to regulate gene expression. So um, one of the things that uh, we have been pushing for here at Active Motif is the identification of complexes, uh, protein complexes that are associated with a transcription factor of interest. And for this, we've been collaborating with the lab of Jason Carroll to um, incorporate RIME, or Rapid immun Immunoprecipitation Mass Spec of Endogenous Proteins. And the way this works is you start by, um, just as you would for a normal chip, by cross-linking your cells and isolating nuclei. You then sonicate your DNA, and you end up with your immunoprecipitated target. Now, in a typical chip-seq experiment, you would isolate the DNA and sequence it. However, in this case, in the case of RIME, you instead isolate the proteins that are in complex, and you uh, isolate them and analyze them by uh, mass spec. And this works for most factors using as little as 10 or 5 times 10 to the 7 cells. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar, mass spectrometry works like this. You have a protein of interest. You then perform a digest with a, an enzyme such as trypsin, leaving you with these peptides. They're then purified and run through mass spec. And each peptide identified uh, has a profile that looks like this and can be mapped to individual proteins in your genome of interest. Now, this bar here represents a full-length gene from or protein from start to finish. And the yellow bars indicate regions for which you have a peptide that mapped to that protein. Green bars indicate regions for which you have a peptide that was post-translationally modified. Now, there are several advantages of RIME over a typical IP mass spec. <clears throat> the first is the preservation of genuine interactions between um, your proteins and other proteins in complex. Basically, cross-linking allows for more stringent watches and minimizes the detection of non-specific proteins. Crosslinking cross also permits the capture of protein-protein uh, of interactions that are lower affinity than, uh, than ones that would be captured by a standard IP mass spec protocol. And this chromatin-based IP actually allows you to capture proteins that were bound to the same fragment of DNA. As you remember, there are several uh, the steps for RIME are similar to that for CHIP, so you're actually sonicating the DNA down to about 500 base pairs. So any proteins that are bound to the same 500 base pair fragment of DNA as your factor of interest would also come down in the IP and would be analyzed by mass spec. And finally, this allows for uh, the processing of para uh, parallel processing of samples for both chip seq and, uh, and mass spec. Uh, one other thing that we've been able to do with RIME is actually to uh, validate your chip seq antibodies. So um, oftentimes you have an antibody that you think uh, targets your factor of interest specifically, and you can actually verify that by pulling it down, uh, by using the antibody to pull down your factor of interest and using RIME to see what isoform of that protein was actually pulled down. Now here I'm going to show you a little bit of data that we've generated here at Active Motif uh, using the RIME assay. The first is for BRD4, which is a so bromo domain containing protein 4. This is found at both promoters and enhancers, and it's been shown to be very important in the regulation of uh, the recruitment of 
co-activators uh, by chromosomal looping. Now, BRD4 here, uh, this experiment, we had very high coverage of the protein, uh, a couple post-translational modifications, and actually co-IP'd, identified by RIME and mass spec, we have histone H3. And if you look at one of those post-translational modifications, you see trima or acetylation of histone H3K27. And this is a histone mark, as I mentioned earlier, that is found at enhancer regions. So BRD4, uh, continuing with this data, one important aspect of this, uh, of this assay is you have to perform it in replicate uh, in order to get the high confidence data that we've been providing to our customers. Um, now, here I show two replicates of BRD4 in MCF7 cells and an IgG replicate, uh, two IgG replicates. Now, the IgG replicates are used to actually subtract out any uh, nonspecific interactions that you would expect um, to happen with any IP. And so these proteins that are identified in the IgG uh, fractions are then subtracted out, and what you're left with are proteins that are confidently enriched for your, um, for your IP of interest. The next set of data here I'm showing is for RNA pull 2 and I, here are two replicates of RNA pull 2 high coverage, 48% coverage for 48 and 43% coverage for these two experiments. And in the list of identified proteins, are uh, among the top three are two of DNA uh, or DNA directed RNA pull two subunits, RBP one and RBP two. And what you can do with this list of proteins is you can actually uh, follow them up with chip seq experiments to verify uh, the colocalization of these proteins with your factor that you've just performed a RIME experiment on. Another thing you can do with this identified list is, um, is run it through a gene ontology program. And here I've shown an example of that where in poll 2 uh, we've identified several different uh, gene ontology terms that are highly enriched within this data set. And those are uh, several that you would expect. You take acid metabolism, RNA met metabolic processes, um, gene expression, and so on and so forth. And this is a further uh, verification that your RIME experiment worked as you would expect. So up to this point, I've told you about RIME, which is a great tool for the de novo discovery of proteins in complex with your factor of interest, and ChIP-seq, which can tell you about the genome-wide distribution of your factors or histone modifications. Now, this isn't always going to answer all of your questions. I know that there are several uh, research groups that are interested in maybe only a few genomic loci, and maybe you want to know which proteins, RNA, and DNAs are bound to that specific locus. And for this, we've been working with Dr. Fuji at Osaka University in developing N-CHIP. This is Engineered DNA Binding Molecule Mediated Chip. And what this is, is a locus-specific chip that takes advantage of the DCAS9, so a mutated, deactivated Cas9 molecule, to target the Cas9 complex to a specific uh, region of interest using a guide RNA. You then perform an immunoprecipitation and pull down that that locus after uh, sonication, and you can then identify, based on what you elute off of this complex, uh, you can identify proteins, RNAs, or DNAs that may be looping or bound to your region of interest. Now, Dr. Fuji has, um, has published several papers on this technique. Um, this here is a, an example of some mass spec data that he was able to generate in this PLOS One paper. Um, and I'm not going to talk too much about NCHIP today just because Dr. Fuji will actually be giving a webinar on this next week on June 8th, and you should all tune in and sign up for that if you're interested. So a summary of my talk today, I've talked about multiple layers of epigenetic me me mechanisms that work to regulate transcription uh, factor access to the DNA. Specifically, CHIP has provided, uh, has been a great tool for studying the distribution of transcription factors and histone modifications, but it has several limitations. Uh, and I've identified these limitations here and how we've addressed them at Active Motif. Finally, uh, mass spec is a new tool that we're using in Active Motif to further analyze your, uh, your epigenetic complexes by identifying proteins that are in complex with your factor of interest. And lastly, locus specific chip or N chip will enable a more holistic approach to determine what regulates a specific promoter or regulatory region that you may be interested in.
so all of the technologies that I talked about today um, are a, it's a very good complete tool set for studying your um, your epigenomic um, factor or system of interest. However, we have several other tools that are available that I didn't talk about today. Those being uh, those that study DNA methylation or hydroxymethylation. You have chip seq validated antibodies that I mentioned in the beginning of my talk. Uh, we have several different versions of our chip um, of our chip technology or chip assay. Whether you're studying transcription factors that are of low abundance using the chip chip at high sensitivity or the chip at express uh, assays, and everything that I mentioned today can really be applied to all fields of biology, not just cancer biology, but neurology, immunology, and whatever system that you study in your own labs. I'd like to thank our collaborators, Dr. Fuji at Osaka University for NCHIP, uh, Jason Carroll for working with us on Rhyme, and Frank Pugh on working with us for, uh, for ChIP-EXO. And the scientists that have developed these assays here at Active Motif, uh, all the kits that I've talked about here are listed with their catalog numbers. And if you have any questions about anything that I've talked about today, you can either type it into the box, and I am happy to answer questions, or you can email us at techservice at activemotif.com. Thanks, Adam. That was a really wonderful talk. Um, so we do have time for questions. We've already had a few come through. So if anyone else does have questions, please pop them into the questions box, and we'll try to get through uh, as many as we can. Um, so one of the first questions is, so if you're looking at Drosophila chromatin landscape, you cannot do the spiking method. Is this correct? That is correct. Um, so because we're using a Drosophila, um, Drosophila chromatin to spike in, uh, we, we have not developed an assay that uh, allows for the um, ChIP-seq studies with spike in, in Drosophila. Okay, and here's a, another question uh, regarding the spike in. Is for the spike in, do I do a double IP? So it's actually, um, in a sense, it is. So you are performing two IPs, but everything is in the same tube. So let's say you have two different IPs that you're that you would do without a spike in. Uh, you have two tubes. Now with spike in, you take those same two tubes and you add a very small amount of Drosophila chromatin and the Drosophila specific antibody on the same tube with your human or mouse chromatin and your human or mouse specific antibody. Okay. Um, for the June D experiment, uh, did you try comparing recombinant versus endogenous after an activating treatment? We did not. Um, we just used a basic uh, HCT116 colorectal cancer cell line. We didn't uh, induce, um, we didn't do anything to induce the activation of June D binding. Okay, and uh, so here's one about uh, a question on chip bisulfite seq. Um, can you do chip bisulfite seq with mm -hmm. H3K27 acetylation? Chip bisulfite seq with H3K27? Uh, yes, and that's actually the example that I showed. Um, and so if you have any, any questions about the optimization of that kind of experiment, please feel free to email us. Okay, so uh, here's a question. Um, how did the chip seek with low numbers compare to the standard cell numbers used? So typically for, um, so this is a service that we developed and typically you use about 10 million cells for a chip seek experiment. And uh, so we've drastically reduced that to 10,000 cells for histone modifications and anywhere from 50 to 500,000 cells 50,000 to 500,000 cells for transcription factor. Okay, oh, just going back to that last question about uh, H3K27 acetylation. Oh, uh, uh, Yeah, sorry, he, okay. he, he's just pointed that out. You, you mentioned methylation, but uh, he was referring to acetylation. Okay, okay, so I'm not sure if, you know, I would expect that H3K27 acetyl would probably not have methylated regions, but uh, I, I see no reason why that assay wouldn't work for that mark. Um, we have antibodies that are very robust, gypsy validated antibodies for K27 acetylation. Um, and so that assay would work. Um, whether or not you'd identify methylated DNA is another question. Okay. Uh, is the TAM chip kit on the market currently? Not yet. So we're currently working out some uh, small, um, some small things that were uh, optimization experiments. And we hope to have that released sometime this year, but we're really excited about it. And uh, initially, we plan on offering a, um, 
a variety of different antibodies conjugated to the um, to that transposase. Okay. Uh, so here's another question regarding that uh, kit. Uh, it says that TAM chip looks like it could have a lot of off-target inserts. What prevents the transposase from integrating the adapters elsewhere? So we've actually looked at that, and uh, it was one of our concerns early on. Now, uh, the if you're familiar with the ATAC-seq protocol, it's essentially it's very similar in that you're using the transposase, that t same TN5 transposase, to integrate these adapters in uh, in the genome. Now, ATAC-seq doesn't have a directed antibody um, function, so you're essentially integrating these adapters at any accessible or open region of the genome. Now, we were concerned initially that uh, the antibody would, um, wouldn't, wouldn't limit the binding sites to your target of interest, and that you'd have off-target um, sites that would overlap with, say, an ATAC-seq data set. However, that's not what we've seen, and we can't... We don't know exactly why that is, but uh, we propose that it's possibly because you have this antibody conjugate. It could be sterically hindering the uh, the ability for the transposase to integrate unless it's actually attached to the, the DNA in, in the case of the TAM chip assay. Okay. Uh, with RIME, to what extent does cross-linking interfere with the downstream MS analysis? I wonder if it's going to decrease your sensitivity as proteins are likely getting intra and inter cross linked which would interfere with peptide analysis. Yes, and that is a uh, that is an issue. However, um, to with our experience, um, that you, know, you do lose some peptides that just cannot be mapped to your protein database of interest. I know that there are some labs that have then gone on to build new protein databases based on those that didn't map to any particular protein in the genome that you're mapping to, or rather the proteome that you're mapping to. So you do tend to lose uh, peptides uh, in their mappability because of the fact that they're cross-linked to each other. Uh, but there are ways, if you are good with proteomics data, to get around that. Okay, and uh, again, related to uh, RIME, are you considering developing a nucleotide enrichment step to RIME so that you're only identifying interacting proteins from your target protein in association with the chromatin? It is something that we've considered. Um, it's something that could potentially increase the sensitivity of the assay by removing anything, any proteins that aren't associated with the chromatin, uh, but it isn't something that we've done quite yet. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, do I understand well that RIME can be used to identify histone modifications associated with binding of the transcription factor that's being pulled down? That's a good question. So it's tricky because histone tails, as you know, have lots of arginines and lysines, which are cleaved in the triptych digest. So it's actually very rare to identify histones. However, when you do have a modification on a histone tail uh, at an arginine or a lysine in this case, it actually does prevent the cleavage of that peptide uh, by trypsin at that particular lysine. So it's possible to identify histone tails, but it's very rare because you actually cleave those uh, those peptide tail, those histone tails to uh, sizes that are um, not measurable by mass spec. There are steps that you could take if you are only interested in histone modifications, such as propinylation of your samples would actually uh, prevent any cleavage of those histone tails, uh, but then what happens is you lose any other um, transcription factor or other factor um, interactions that you would otherwise identify. Okay, and for chip bisulfite sequencing, what's the minimum number of cells required? Chip bisulfite sequencing, um, that is a good question. So I am not the scientist who worked on that assay, but if you were to email tech services at Active Motif or check out our webpage, I'm sure that you could find it at one of those two locations. Sorry, I can't be more helpful. Nope, that's absolutely fine. Thank you. Um, so for TAM chip, what is the size of the fragment that the transpose A's cuts? Can the size of the DNA fragment be optimized? That's something that we've worked on in-house. Um, and it's really dictated by the length of the linker between the transpose A's and the um, and the antibody, and so that's that's something that cannot be optimized by the user, but it's something that we're working on in-house to find the kind of the sweet spot in uh, the length of the fragments that are isolated. Okay, um, 
so how many cells do you need for one rhyme experiment and does it vary for different types of factors? It does vary. So we found that for very robust factors such as pol 2 beta-catenin, uh, BRD4, we've gotten away with 50,000 cells uh, pretty robustly. However, for more, um, I guess, sparse factors that don't associate with the chromatin quite as nicely as those factors that I mentioned, you will need quite a few more, many more cells than, than 50,000. And this is something that we're actually working on optimizing at the moment. So we have, this has been released as a service as of now, and we continue to make improvements on the assay to address issues just like that. Okay, so um, did you try uh, chip bisulfite sequencing with other modifications uh, like H3K36 methylation or H3K79 uh, methylation? You know, I'm not quite sure exactly which data or what data has been generated in-house for that assay. Um, again, I think I'm going to have to refer you to tech services uh, or our website for that question. Um, okay. So I think that's uh, all we've got time for today. Uh, so it just uh, leaves me to say thank you again, Adam, for a really wonderful presentation and a really wonderful discussion. And thanks to the audience uh, for all your questions. Um, if you do have any questions, obviously you can get in contact um, with Adam. This webinar will be available online at Epigenie in the next few days, so you can go back and rewatch it. Um, so all the best uh, from us at Epigenie. Thanks again for logging on. And don't forget about our another upcoming uh, webinar that's happening on Monday. Uh, check it out and you can find it on our webinars page on Epigenie to sign up there. So thanks again for joining us and thanks again, Adam. Thank you very much.